today's politics, let's say you're in an upscale, uh, an uppity white suburban waspy neighborhood, and you see someone who does not fit the, the, the culture of the area. So <laughs> let's just substitute a couple of the words. Don't worry. I, I already put the parts that are necessary at the start of the sentence. So I've already said white. Yes, we've established that white waspy neighborhood. Now, let's just say someone comes along who isn't of that. Profiling versus criminal profiling. Criminal profiling is different. I'll say what a lot of cops want to say. There's a difference between racially profiling and criminally profiling. Okay. If I'm in a very nice neighborhood okay. and I know what, you know, the cars in that area looks like and the people in that area look like, and all of a sudden I see something that looks like an anomaly in that neighborhood, it's my job to start investigating this, not to fabricate probable cause, but to see, I, I right there, I think that there's a problem with the system then, right? Because you, you pretty much said out loud, if you're in an affluent neighborhood and there's something that looks out of place, a poor, if there's a poor in a rich part of town, then that has to be investigated. I mean, that pretty much lays it out as plainly as possible that, yes, this is a uh, class war, ultimately, but unfortunately, class wars fall along racialized lines. There's disproportionately going to be more people in other categories that have historically been oppressed for a variety of reasons. Find a way to, hey, there is some crime or there's reasonable suspicion or probable cause, something where I can look into this car. You just said that it's not my job to invent this, but I have to find a probable cause <laughs> or this ped stop or whatever the case may be and see what's going on. See if and if the person has a right to. So you do have quite a few rights afforded to you. I'm assuming if you are listening to this in the United States or in Canada, you have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which, yes, does prohibit you against unwanted searches and seizures. So the police aren't actually allowed to just walk up to any citizen and be like, hey, by the way, we need you to empty out all your pockets and show us all your possessions. This changes when they have probable cause, however, if there's something that they have seen that uh, makes them suspicious that you may have either drugs or weaponry or something on your person or that you may be in the act of or about to uh, commit a crime. Now, that's why why I think when you take a lot of, and again, this is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, please go consult a lawyer. I'm a person talking to you on the internet. Do not use anything I say as legal advice. But uh, that's why you'll see when you get a lot of people talking to you about human rights issues in relation to how you speak to police officers. Um, if a police officer is not arresting you, then they do not have a right to detain you, right? You can ask, officer, am I under arrest? And then they have to tell you what you are being arrested for. If not, then you don't have to speak to them. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to have this, uh, it, you know, conversation where everything you say could be used as more probable cause, as potential as to why. Now, please, again, be safe. Please, again, if you ever need legal advice, consult lawyers, not people on the internet. And always know that if you are in a position where someone is trying to uh, interrogate you or whatever that is, then, uh, you know, trying to do the whole libertarian freeman of the land, I do not consent uh, while like driving through uh, what you are considering imaginary borders, those borders will become very real very rapidly before your very eyes. Yes, what is once imaginary will manifest itself in the form of lots and lots of state troopers suddenly pointing guns at your face so no simply saying i do not consent doesn't make uh society just uh, go away it's it's not like a conjuring or a spell so there's a reason why there's so many of those videos and why there's compilations of it and it, yes it's usually extremely funny because there's people who simply think that they can do whatever they want uh as long as they say the magic words as long as i say the magic words be there this is where you need to take it to the next step as a cop and say hey my apologies this right. is why I stopped you and give them the courtesy yeah. of understanding. Right. That. So, so now here's the issue though, in today's politics, let's say you're in an upscale, uh, an uppity white suburban waspy neighborhood and you see someone who does not fit the, the, the culture of the area. So <laughs> let's just substitute a couple of the words. Don't worry. I, I already put the parts that are necessary at the start of the sentence. So I've already said white. Yes, we've established that. White, waspy neighborhood. Now, let's just say someone comes along who isn't of that culture. Yeah, so so then what do you do? Let's say they're, like, the clothes they're wearing seem out of place. And Baby? that in and of itself, not that big a deal, might happen. But this person 
It's true. It has been known to happen. Yes, in white affluent neighborhoods. There are non-white people who enter those neighborhoods. It has happened. Walks over to somebody who walks out of a house and they do the, you know, the quick high five, whatever, the, 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 hand the hand handoff, hand. right? And then when the guy, you're like, okay. I, I almost missed that one. Are you talking about like a, a drug deal? Are you talking about the marijuana being sold? You know, a couple of those reefer cigarettes being, being sold on the streets? No way. So that's the handoff. Okay, I think we just got a drug deal. But then he turns around and his shirt says Black Lives Matter. Oh. And I'm, and I'm, I'm only half kidding, I'm like making this silly. But now you really do run the risk of if you approach this guy, are you facing political repercussions? Because he's going to. That's something that most cops must be thinking all the time, eh? Right? Right? Right before they do something like an action. Uh, yeah. Hmm. But am I going to get canceled over this? Yeah, it does suck because, like, if you happen to be part of the Black Lives Matter movement, then you are just impervious to laws and, and they just go away as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that does seem to be a pattern, too. Most people who are wearing Black Lives Matter shirts are definitely getting away with a lot more than they would had they not been wearing those shirts. A claim, oh, look at me, I'm a minority in this white neighborhood wearing a Black Lives Matter and the cop came after me. And that's where, that's where phase one happens. You're the cop, you do your job. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how it's going to look politically. But you're also right. The <laughs> Wait, so you're just straight up admitting that? Like, so if there's someone who doesn't look there from that culture showing up in the white neighborhood and then they also happen to be wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt, you still have to do that thing where like, well, clearly, you know, there's, there's a difference between uh, racial profiling and criminal profiling. So they, they admit the criminal profiling part of it. And so then at that point, you can question them thoroughly and then maybe uh, search them and then do what you got to do. And then at that point, uh, you can determine whether or not they've committed a crime. You don't worry about the repercussions. Re the reality of that is, is he's going to be on the news. He's going to have, you know, cop watchers coming after him. And he's probably going to find himself in a situation where his agency is going to put him on admin leave or terminate him. So, so there's one thing that you pointed out that I want to at least draw, draw attention to. When you say cop watchers, that's literally Antifa. Okay, that that's who they are. They're they're <laughs> okay. And if they were, <laughs> I think it's a good thing. I, I think it's a good thing if the public wants to hold the people who have state power accountable for their actions. Probably a good thing. Like I, I'm not even talking about the fact that like you know this is in Vancouver, Canada, by the way, the progressive capital, the communist utopia that not a lot of people get to live in. But I do live in Vancouver, Canada, and yeah, the, the cops kind of just do whatever the fuck they want. There's a lot of times when you'll just be sitting at like a four way, and all of a sudden the cops obviously like, oh, I don't want to wait for this light. Turns on the buzzers, goes to the light, and when that happens, like, ah, oh, asshole. But like, I, I don't think that warrants people running around chasing uh, the police at every second to watch every single time they do that because like there would just be too much fucking footage of like yeah cops just turn on the lights to be able to get to wherever they want to go quicker uh, but when there's cops who are actually like you know violating people's civil rights when they are forcibly searching them and when they are disproportionately searching people who happen to be indigenous because they fit the profile they're not of the culture of the area you know of course this is criminal profiling not racial profiling but yeah at that point i think it is probably a good thing if citizens have the ability to phone uh use their phones film them make sure that uh, people are safe or people that are affiliated with the far left that are affiliated with all of the whole a cab stuff they are people that l are constantly looking for a reason to highlight any kind of interaction that they can put into a bad light and these this is political this is part of the political but then to defeat them wouldn't the cops stop doing illegal shit or not keep racially profiling people or not abusing their power because then there wouldn't be anything to film <laughs> at the end of the day. Antifa would just be wasting a whole bunch of time. Wouldn't that be awesome? Ah, we've defeated Antifa again by actually doing the job we're supposed to do, that we're paid for <laughs> by the city to do. Foiled ya. Warfare that's going on in the United States right now. People think that it's only like pundits on TV talking smack. It's not. It's, it's when activists go after normal, everyday people that are trying to do the normal, everyday things that keep our society functioning. And the reason that you see such a spike in crime in New York City is because of these types of behaviors. Because if a cop is afraid, I'm going to do my job and then I'm going to be on the news, it's not worth it for him because they're just trying to catch a paycheck. They're but, just trying to keep their kids in school and 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 have a have a, a 401k. Let's, let, let, let me add to this. Cop watchers are the people who when a squatter breaks into a house in New York and the homeowner yes. calls the police, the cop. 
from the NYPD Public Safety on New York One. The NYPD overall crime is down in January. The city saw a drop in overall crime in January, but transit crime spiked up from over a year. The NYPD data released on Monday shows the city's overall crime index uh, decreased by 2.9% overall. And in terms of the subway... Mayor Eric Adams, NYPD say crime is down across New York City on city streets and in the subway system. This is April 4th, 2024. It would seem that crime is down. But it's spiking. Watchers are there to defend the squatters. You've got the National Lawyers Guild. These are these are not this is not a lawyers guild, as you might think it is. They use clever words. These are progressive activists. And I'll tell you the, the distinction. You think the ACLU is there to defend civil liberties. No, they're there. I, I personally think progressive activists sounds better than lawyers guild. <laughs> this is not that noble outfit that you've heard of the lawyers guild. I know it sounds noble in a lot of ways, but this is actually progressive activist Antifa. Yes defend the left. Yeah. The, the National Lawyers Guild is not a group of lawyers to keep an eye on police. They're there to defend the left. Example being about seven or eight years ago. Kind of sounds like this dynamic is playing out in that it's uh, about defending civil rights, civil liberties, the things that the right pretends to care about, that kind of stuff, you know, from, again, unwanted interactions with the police, which are disproportionately going to affect people in already marginalized communities. And so uh, if there are organizations that are standing up for the civil rights of, again, civilians, and then they happen to be leftist by definition. Well, isn't that interesting? State power, the enforcement of state power. You know, it's, it's kind of like Tim Pool's been raging with the machine this whole time. In Boston, this is, a, no, this, is a, this is about seven years ago. In Boston, left-wing and right-wing groups had gathered at a park and were protesting. The National Lawyers Guild stayed with Antifa to defend them. And I'm like, now hold on there a minute. This is not a police versus leftist interaction. This is a right versus left thing. And I asked the, the NLG, how come you guys are only on one side? And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, how come you aren't watching the guys over there? In fact, the people on the right were unarmed. They had shields and the people on the left had crowbars and baseball bats. Whoa. Shouldn't you be observing both for police interactions? And they yeah. were like, what do you mean? These organizations exist to defend people. True story. This happened. And that was the response. What do you mean? Fuck. Damning if true. Well, from yeah. to defend yeah. the left in general from all threats, external police or otherwise. Right. When was the last time the ACLU went to bat for Second Amendment rights? And so the exactly. Yeah. And so <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has capitalist brain on the right, and they're all so fucking poisoned from it, and they have no understanding of how the world actually works. But they still are kind of curious as to why there is injustices and why things don't work out the way they always wanted. I was sold a dream. And that dream has been taken to me by the commies, the gays, and I think the immigrants, the bad minorities too. Yeah, the ones who want to become pilots just because they're black. All those groups. They're taking it from all of us. So Seriously. And so these are political organizations that are tied in with activist organizations. The people oh that God. are like that are currently fighting Funded with cops in millionaires? Georgia. Stop Soros? Cop City. Like are the, the, those people, those, those are, that, again, is all Antifa. They're all connected to the far left. They're all, they're likely all communists. They likely all share the same politics. And I know that it, it's it's like we're kind of honing in on the same thing frequently when we talk about communists. But the reason is this is a a cultural revolution that touches every part of your life, and a lot of people don't realize it. So the reason the cops aren't aren't you know enforcing the actual law in New York City is because of the politicians, and the politicians all have. Well, let, let me, essentially the same political bent. Let, let, let me ask you guys this. You, you saw this thread in New York where the cops came and arrested the homeowner. The, the squatting one? So they're, Was they're, that it? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. 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 The homeowner shows up and says, they changed my locks. They don't live here. They had no proof they lived there. They had no lease. The guy ends up apparently showing some kind of bill. And the cops said, that's good enough for me and arrested the homeowner. Yeah. No, Why does that happen? That wouldn't fly on me. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, here's the, here's the problem with that. And, and this is why I, sometimes guys like me put a I, I, you put an X on your back just because you're trying to do the right thing. And, and you know, like, there's a reason why I got the Constitution tattooed on my arm. It's not because it looks cool. It's because you, know, you believe it for doing the right thing. But people mm. need to have like rebar in their back. Well, and, and, the, and, and this might shock the public sure. in the academy. You don't study the Constitution from start to finish. You highlight mostly the Fourth Amendment because cities are thinking about liability. What we do routine shooting every year, most agencies have it where at least every 
I'm going to be honest with you. That's low on my list of worries when it comes to the way the police are trained. I'm not sitting there thinking like, oh, man, this really goes to show that the police hadn't studied the Constitution thoroughly, start to finish, and knew every single part of it. It seems like a lot more of it has to do with the fact that so much of it is about self-preservation and, you know, a high and hypervigilance at all times, thinking that anyone could potentially be a threat and training consistently uh, towards not de-escalation, which would most likely benefit both the people that the police interact with and uh, the police themselves, but uh, again, in hypervigilance as to uh, self-preserving themselves and then other police officers first and foremost, and then after that maintain public safety, but that in and of itself can be a threat to public safety. That's why police officers have acorns falling on the cars and they're shooting up city blocks, thinking that they're currently under attack. Six months, you got to requalify it because it's a perishable skill. Well, guess what? If you haven't studied the Constitution since you were in the academy and you're five years, ten years, the Constitution needs to be something that cops go over routinely. Why? Because the one thing you realize is that penal code book that's bigger than a Bible has a yeah. lot of laws in there that are contrary to the Constitution. And if cops actually know the Constitution, they're going to be in a position to even step back against their agency. I, I do want to point out one thing I love so much is when these activists are getting arrested and they yell, I have not been read my rights. <laughs> And I, I'm just sitting there being like, these people watch too much TV. Most street they, cops never read the rights. You give it to the detectives. Well, right. But like these people. Are you talking about your Miranda rights? Which again, this is not a Canadian thing. This is an American thing. But like, I, the, yeah, they, they should be reading them. The Miranda rights. That's what you are supposed to do. That, that, that is procedure. You also have to let a citizen know why they're being arrested, what they're being arrested for. So procedure. Again, I'm a, I'm a Canadian and I know that. It's not just from the movies. <laughs> These far leftists throw a brick at a cop, get arrested, and then they're like, they're not reading me my rights. It's like, yeah, because we all watched you do it, dude. We don't need to read you your rights. <laughs> well, there's there's no not the point. It's not the point. Uh, everyone's supposed to be equal within the eyes of the law. Obviously, that's not the case, but that's what it's supposed to be in principle. So that when you're being arrested, you're supposed to be read your Miranda rights. So you're supposed to know what you're being arrested for, that you have the right to an attorney, uh, that the, the entire process being that, hey, we don't know whether or not, even if the cop himself is going to be a witness in the case, if the cop is going to testify that, yes, I firsthand witnessed you to commit this crime, they're still going to be able to have their day in court. That police officers aren't simply just going to run around playing Judge Dredd. No investigation to two, be had. Two things need to be in play for Miranda. When everybody's talking about the rights of Miranda, you need to have custody and integration. The, the both have to exist together in order to, to be advised of Miranda. If you just have one, you're not going to get it. So yeah, just, but, just arresting somebody, you don't have to read so, Miranda. So for all these people out there who don't get it, if you are witnessed committing a crime, they're not going to read you your rights. They don't need to. They're not, they, they don't need to. They yes, they need to learn more. I'm curious. In the United States, the Miranda warning is a type of notification customarily given by police to criminal suspects in police custody or custodial interrogation, advising them of their right to silence and in effect protecting from self-incrimination that is the right to refuse to answer questions or provide information to law enforcement or other officials. Named for the U.S. Supreme Court 1966 decision Miranda v. Arizona, these rights are often referred to as Miranda rights. The purpose of such notification is to preserve the uh, admissibility of their statements made during custodial interrogation in later criminal proceeding. The idea came from law professor uh, Yale Kamazar, who subsequently was dubbed the father of Miranda. Miranda. Uh, the language used in the Miranda warnings derives from the Supreme Court's opinion in its Miranda decision, but specific language used in warnings varies from, between jurisdictions, and that warning is deemed adequate as long as the defendant's rights are properly disclosed, such as that the waiver of those rights by the defendant is knowing, voluntary, and intelligent. For example, the warning may be phrased as follows. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions. You have the right to have a lawyer with you during questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed to you before any questioning if you wish. If you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer, present you have the right to stop answering at any time now having been told this you may have a slightly stronger or perhaps i would say uh, a, a bigger desire to speak directly to a lawyer before speaking to the police officers that's not to say you're going to get a good lawyer you could get a public defender who again is just looking at every single case as just a matter of numbers they look at the, the writing on the wall they'll give you just very plain tax hey I, you could do four to five the, what we're looking at maybe three good behavior uh based on what i see here uh you know it's your second charge you've done this and i basically have to get out of here to move on to my next case because I, I have so many I, the, the, I have a ton of fucking cases this kind of just breaks down to there's less of a chance of me being able to properly defend you but if you have money 
then you can afford a much better lawyer who will have a entire legal team who can then look into your case and start telling you things and then doing investigations and being like, well, that police officer had a history of racism and, and, and violence towards uh, civilians. Uh, you actually were not read your Miranda rights. Uh, you were actually, uh, he improperly searched your person at this point. Uh, at this point, uh, like, and then lawyer might have a much better ability to be able to protect you uh, from facing, uh, you know, further consequences for what happened. The Miranda warning is part of a preventive criminal procedure rule that law enforcement are required to administer to protect an individual who is in custody and subject to direct questioning or is functional equivalent from the violation of their Fifth Amendment right to run against compelled self-incrimination. That's where you get the I plead the Fifth. Miranda versus Arizona, the Supreme Court held that the admission of an uh, elicited incriminating statement by a suspect not informed of these rights violates the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment right to counsel through the incorporation of these rights into state law. Thus, if law enforcement officials decline to offer a Miranda warning to an individual in their custody, they may interrogate that that person and act upon the knowledge gained, but may not ordinarily use that person's statement as evidence against them in a uh, criminal trial. Which is interesting because I feel while they're complaining about the Constitution, that this feels like it's directly related to constitutional law itself. I have a witness who said you did it. Right. I saw you do it. I'm a witness. What, what am I? I'm not going to question you. Right. But the, the cops aren't the judges, right? That's they're the ones doing the arrest. So even if the cop is going to be a witness, even if the cop is going to testify, that's a matter for the cop to do in the court, right? Not not to be like, you should be able to waive all rights because you saw it happen. I saw the crime. I witnessed it, okay? I sentenced you to death. Over anything, you're going, you're, you're going to arrest it. Right, until I start speaking to you and questioning you, there's no... I mean, you want to read them their rights, read them their rights, but you know, as soon as you put the cuffs on them legitimately... You put him in the car. You never read me my rights. Brother, I haven't said a word to you yet. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to talk. I'm, I'm not questioning. Everyone's just laughing their ass off. And now oh, how we laughed. It's funny. It's, it's funny violating people's rights. Can't play the whole thing for you because of copyright protection. So I'll link it in the description. But the main thing you need to know is that it has a really strong start. Whoop, whoop. That's the sound of the police. Whoop, whoop. That's the sound of the police. It essentially functions like wrestling entrance music with that iconic beginning. So when you picture cops using it as a cell phone ringtone or blasting it from the car, for a lot of them, I don't think it's any deeper than that because they may have never actually listened to the lyrics. Lyrics that say things like, I know this for a fact, you don't like how I act, you claim I'm selling crack, but you be doing that. I'd rather say see it because I would never be a, be a officer, you wicked overseer. You hot shot, want to get props and be a savior? First show a little respect, change your behavior, change your attitude, change your plan. There could never really be justice on stolen land. Let me tell you from experience, if there's one thing cops hate, it's being told to show respect to members of the public. Especially people who are, you know. Police officers are trained to demand and expect respect from members of the public. And they withhold giving it until you've earned it from them. So right there, you'd think cops would hate this song. But then the lyrics get even more feisty. And yes, I know me reading out rap lyrics is like the height of cringe, but my hands are tied here. Anyway, he goes on you to You got a Ben Shapiro. Man. Yeah, officer from Overseer. You need a little clarity? Check the similarity. The Overseer rode around the plantation. The officer is off patrolling all the nation. The Overseer could stop you what you're doing. The officer will pull you over just when he's pursuing. The overseer had the right to get ill, and if you fought back, the overseer had the right to kill. The officer has the right to arrest, and if you fight back, they put a hole in your chest. In a couple previous videos, I've touched on the origins of modern policing and how police departments evolved, directly or indirectly, from fugitive slave patrols. An entire genre of vagrancy laws were invented during and after the Civil War to criminalize newly freed black people and allow cops to put them in prison where they were, you guessed it, forced back into labor without their consent. So KRS-1 is absolutely 100% not being hyperbolic when he links police officers to plantation overseers. There is a direct line there. And because of that, it's also apt to link the plantation overseer's exclusive monopoly on violence to a police officer's similar monopoly on violence. So for as fun as the whoop whoop beginning is, the track is very, is very unapologetically anti-cop and in no uncertain terms. Why would a police officer tolerate the song, much less play it gleefully? Same with a cop playing Rage Against the Machine or N.W.A. or Callous Dowboys. How can they listen to music made by people who loathe them? Like I said, I have two explanations. The first is as simple as it is infuriating. It's a display of total power. A cop blasting an anti-cop song with a smile on his face is showing you that your pouty little art projects have no effect on him. He is showing you that he isn't threatened by radical art. 
that it is so powerless to affect change, he can even enjoy it and dance along. I remember once on patrol we were hassling some gang members loitering at a park or whatever, and one of them said something to me like, You're just a fat pig who was too stupid to get a real job. So I smiled and I said, hey, stand up. He stood up, probably assuming I was about to arrest him or something. And then I said, okay, sit back down. He sat back down all confused. And I said, I may be a fat, stupid pig, but you still stand and sit when and where I tell you to. I'm not proud of this attitude, but it is the same mindset as with anti-cop music. Tell your little yeah, jokes all you want. You still obey me. I'm still above you. This idea reminds me a lot of what big brain academics would call recuperation. Ron Adams, translating Guy Debord, defines recuperation as the process by which politically radical ideas and images are diluted, twisted, co-opted, absorbed, diffused, incorporated, annexed, and commodified within media culture and bourgeois society, and thus become interpreted through a neutralized, innocuous, or more socially conventional perspective. However, the anarchists of the Ontario-based North Shore Collective put a little spin on this idea, and I think it's really apt. In a blog post opposing a prison expansion, they write, The state will try to undermine any anti-expansion organizing taking place, and the best way for them to do that is to take up a version of our demands and use them to justify expansion and reform. In a word, recuperation. Recuperation. Oh, well, for that, that they just don't understand the lyrics, that one's the second part, but a little more so that they, the, the police officers who do understand the lyrics, there are some of them who think that they're the good cops. Do haughty demonstrations of power that wasn't the head told you that I was actually pretty reasonable and actually pretty cool, and thus I could listen to KRS-One critique the police because I agreed with him that cops who act like plantation overseers are bad. And I could agree with him because I wasn't one of those bad cops. I know. I know. Just settle down. We're getting there. As a white guy raised in upper middle class Orange County, my understanding of racism is that it was a personal failing mainly perpetrated by loser skinheads and hillbilly clan members. Racism was a bad thought that one guy would entertain about another person that could lead that guy to making a cruel or violent choice. And I was raised on Captain Planet and Fresh Prince and very special episodes of Saved by the Bell. So I knew that everyone was created equal, that no one should be mocked or hassled just for being different. I had dated black girls and Mexican girls. My ex-pastor dad was tight with his Hispanic outreach team. I used to swap shareware game CDs with the Dominican kid on my bus. Shout out to Wani, hope you're still gaming out there. In fact, I guess you could say, I was pretty colorblind. So when KRS-One or Rage Against the Machine were yelling about racist cops, racist government, fascism, injustice, I could nod and say, yeah, I'm totally with you with absolute sincerity and a totally clear conscience. Their critiques were valid. I didn't want to return to segregation and Jim Crow. I didn't support Westboro Baptist protesting funerals. I was a huge critic of LAPD's corrupt Rampart division at the time. I never once planted guns or drugs on anybody. Which again, that specific division was basically what a lot of people could just point towards being like, okay, yes, we're going to take this time to call out bad policing. And there are bad uh, cops who are corrupt and do corrupt things for sure. And they're the bad apples. Again, it, that's why we need to we need to do reform. We need to fix uh, the system that has uh, allowed a few bad apples to take advantage of it. And I saw American History the cracks, X like five times. To put it simply, KRS-One and Rage Against the Machine were complaining about those guys over there, not me. Of course this is incorrect. It wasn't until many years later that I understood what the machine meant in Rage Against the Machine. It wasn't until years later that I understood that KRS-One's linking of police to slave patrols wasn't just for thematic flavor. It took me a very long time to understand that racism, that fascism, that injustice wasn't merely something that individuals did to other individuals at specific dates and times, but rather interlocking systems that are self-perpetuating. This is what I try to tell people a lot, too, because like you don't need to have been a police officer and done all the things that he's done to come to that re realization. But there's just like there's so much of your life where you grow up and you think, well, yeah, racism, when it rears its ugly head, it's going to be really obvious. You're going to see it. It's going to be some white guy is probably going to have a shaved head. He's going to be running down the street saying the N word and saying all the worst things you could possibly. Well, that's a racist. That's that's what a racist looks like. And it's a, yeah, it's good that, you know, we call out racists because uh, they're terrible people. Look at them. They're, they're literally putting on hoods and then going on horses and they think they're a bunch of ghosts. 
ghosts who are going to usher in some kind of new age. Th those are racists. We can point out the racists. The rest of us, you know, the good whites, uh, we're able to identify that, call it out, and then everything should just go on as it is, right? We do have a lot of cool things these days, you know, NyQuil. Society, cars, fleshlights, all the wonders of Western civilization. Probably should stop talking about indigenous genocide and keep bringing that up. Probably should stop talking about the North Atlantic slave trade, getting everyone all bored about that, and start working towards what exactly are we going to do. Forget my racist past. Let's talk about the racist future that we could all have by ignoring the rest of the stuff. And all-encompassing. The area that I worked in was about 90% first and second generation immigrant, mainly from Mexico, but also Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And while I could confidently say I don't arrest people just for being Mexican, it took me many years to see that the system, the machine, didn't need me to be personally bigoted to do the work of bigotry. When an immigrant can't get a driver's license and can't get a legal job, so they get paid under the table, get exploited by their boss, and we show up to keep the peace if they complain. It doesn't matter whether the responding officers like Mexicans or not, because the cops will protect the exploiting boss over the exploited worker. When an immigrant is kept in a state of precarity through this labor exploitation and they can't make rent, the cops showing up to forcibly evict them are contributing to that exploitation, whether or not they gave the blind side five stars on Letterboxd. And when some children of these precarious families grow up watching society exploit and abuse their parents and they act out in rebellious ways, cops enforce the curfew laws, the loitering laws, and the vagrancy laws that trap those kids in a carceral vortex that strips them of agency, strips them of legal protection, and opens them up to, you guessed it, labor exploitation inside prison and out of it. There's this phrase I've been obsessed with ever since I heard it a few weeks ago. It's a systems thinking heuristic coined by cybernetics researcher Stafford Beer, and it goes like this. The purpose of a system is what it does. What this means is that, according to Beer, whatever the designers and builders of a system claim to want, a system's purpose can be discovered by the actual effects that it has in the world, rather than effects it consistently fails to achieve. If a system constantly arrives at a certain outcome, that outcome is the purpose of the system. Timondi, Omni, Peanut Butter Blondie, Political Poppy, Preston Kroll, Quite 185, Richard Bomey, Riley and Anna, Roller Dragon, Ruby, Cernicus, Stellar Gwyn, Sebastian Demmel, Travis McClinton, and Words Greenwood. As well as every other person you see on the screen right now, this show would not be possible without them. And if you want to join these wonderful people who make this entire program possible, simply go to patreon.com slash the serps and you can unlock uncensored and bonus episodes and, you know, help us exist.